had this boyfriend and we were at TGI Fridays. I was telling him, I was like, it's hard to change yourself, it's hard to change your outlook. It's not that easy. And he was like, no, it really is that easy. It is just as easy as changing your mind. He gave me this example. He's like, OK, imagine you're in a job that you hate, in like some cubicle job, and like everyone you work with is like a fucking asshole, and your boss sucks. You're miserable every second. But in five minutes, five minutes, you're about to get off work and go off to vacation in Bora Bora. It's the first vacation you've taken in years. How do you feel? Oh, I feel pretty great. I'm really, you know, excited about my vacation. He's like, OK, fast forward. You're on the beach in Bora Bora. It's been the best vacation of your life. But in five minutes, you're going to have to put down your little pina colada inside of your coconut. And you'll probably never go back to Bora Bora again. And who knows when you'll be able to take another vacation. It could be never. How do you feel in that moment? I'm like, oh, I'd feel pretty shitty. He's like, well, think about this. There you are in your shitty job that you hate. And you feel great. And you're on the beach in Bora Bora in a beautiful place. And you feel shitty. You can choose to be happy regardless of what your situation is because it's really not the environment that determines your happiness, it's your mindset. I was just like, oh my God, my brain was spilling all over the counter of TGI Fridays. set for the gold medal duel. Fifteen seconds for gold medal and rebound. A golden smile. My mom always said she wanted me to know what it feels like to be best in the world because no matter what happens to you later, you always have that to use the inspiration and know you can do anything you want. But I really think that going on a journey of self-discovery is just as important as finding a goal to work on. Man, after two Olympics, not going to a single party in high school, not going to a single dance, not going to a single prom, I had big time FOMO, big time FOMO. And my plans in life, I was like, I want to be a bartender, and I want an apartment, a car, and a dog. That was it. That was my life plan. Basically, I just wanted to party and drink all year. Redwood was the pirate theme bar that I worked at. They had a little TV behind the bar and would have MMA on sometimes. And I'd be standing behind the bar and I would like break down the fights and be like, well, this person's not doing this and they should have done that. And that's what this is called and that's what this is. And people would just be like, you don't know what you're talking about. I'd be like, yeah, man, I did like judo. I'm like judo, what's that, like karate? Nobody in MMA does judo. That's just a bullshit martial art. I was like, Fuck you. I am the baddest bitch on the planet, and I just have no outlet to prove this. But I knew, because judo was like the most competitive combat sport for women at the time. So I kind of was taught and raised to make every match into a fight. Because, yeah, those other bitches could like play the rules of the referees and get more points than me. But if I made it into a fight, I could beat the shit out of all of them. And so 
I knew every single time that I walked on that with someone, I would just like bow in and be like, I could kill this bitch with my bare hands. So I already knew that about myself, but nobody else did. <laughs> I just thought I was a drunk pirate that thought she could beat everybody up. Redwood was very kind about uh, me drinking at work and I appreciate that. In hindsight, I was like, man, I shouldn't have spent that time just fucking around and I should have just started fighting and training earlier, but everything happened at the exact time I needed to. And I needed to go through that to figure it out. I found out about MMA when I was like a kid. My mom would drive me to like five different judo clubs a week to make sure I got to fight like different kinds of styles and stuff like that. Manny Gamburion was the student of my mom's old teammate, and my mom would pay Manny to come and give me like private lessons in the afternoon. And so Manny would work with me, and I learned all the throws that I could learn. And I had to spend all my time learning arm bars. To them, I was just like the crazy little girl that would just show up and cry half of practice. Not because I was getting beat up on, but if any of them threw me once, I would cry the rest of the training. I'd get embarrassed that I got thrown. And it didn't matter if they were 50 pounds heavier than me and had five, 10 years more experience. Because who the fuck should throw me? <laughs> I, I hated any, if anyone could get the best of me for even a fucking second, it would hurt my heart. Manny started doing MMA started really doing well, and everyone was really starting to respect judo. So when I quit judo after 08, I reconnected with Manny, and I wanted to keep grappling. And so I just started coming in there and grappling just for fun. The guys would be like, oh, Rhonda, you're so awesome. You're so great. You could kill any of these bitches. And I'm like, yeah, I know I could. I should, I should fight, right? They're like, no, definitely not. You're too pretty. You're like, don't, don't get punched in the face. This is, do something else. I'm like, but I can kill all these girls. But like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like, you can kill all of them and what? Like, who cares? There's no career in it. There's no future for you. Don't waste your time. My mom really wanted me to go to college. You have to understand, like, I have a very educated family. My dad ran an aerospace company, like General Dynamics. Like, he ran that factory. My mom is a PhD in educational psychology. She got a perfect score in the SATs, graduated college at 19, was working as an engineer in the 80s while she won the world championships in judo. It was just like everyone in my family was super educated, and I was a stupid, dumb jock and was doing nothing with my life. And so my mom really wanted me to go to college. And then I was like, damn, got to have this conversation with my mom. I told my mom, I'm like, hey, so what I want to do is uh, <clears throat> I want to do MMA. I'm going to do that. She goes, what? MMA, I'm going to fight. She goes, that's the stupidest fucking idea I've ever heard in my life. And she like thinks to herself and kind of like, this, this is the stupidest fucking idea I've ever heard in my life. I was like, well, you know, I'm going to do it anyway. So just give me a year to make this work. Uh, before you disown me. So I had the entire world to prove wrong at that point. I was 100% positive, and I still am, that I was the baddest bitch on the planet. And I was so sure that I'm like, OK, I am the star of my own movie. Like, I, I am the star of my own kind of Rocky happening right now. I felt like I was in the montage of that moment. Like, I, I just knew that I, I could do it, but I had to make it mean something. <laughs> I had to work three jobs. I was a vet tech at physical therapy for dogs. And then I was also working graveyards at 24 Hour Fitness. And then I also taught judo at this MMA place that was like 50 bucks a class. And then every day I was training at least twice a day. I was completely just running myself ragged. My car became like legendary for how disgusting it was. 05 used Honda Accord that I called the Fonda, Fonda Ronda's Honda. I got it myself with my, well, you know, money that I got from winning bronze at the Olympics, which only actually paid for half of it. And the AC in my car didn't work. I had one window that, that worked, the driver's side window. I would just sweat and die in there. I was really struggling to make rent. I 
slept in that car a couple times. I think the longest stint was for a week. I was just fucking exhausted. It was past the montage, like, happy uppity music part and, like, leading into, like, oh, my God, I'm, like, fucking so tired part. And the really frustrating thing about training was nobody was taking me seriously. I was the only person taking me seriously. And I was just like, fuck everybody. I'm going to go be the best in MMA, and you're all going to kiss my ass. I went to several different gyms to try and get training for striking, because I knew that was the one thing I was missing. I knew I was better than anybody on the ground. I was better than, than anybody at taking people down. That was the one part I was missing. I knew, it, I knew what I wasn't good at. And uh, nobody would give me the time of day. Manny and them, they were at GFC Gundell Fighting Club. And so I started coming, and at least they weren't outright mean to me. But I also, like, I feel like an idiot. I'm like, they're like, yeah, go hit the bag or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would have to watch Edmund coach other people. And watching other people get coached was the closest that I could get to coaching. I would come in, I would work hard, I tried my best to like do the whole million dollar baby thing. Nobody gave a shit. I was on the verge of eviction. I was starting to crack. And then one day I just like, blew up at Edmund. And I'm like, why don't you train me? I come in here, I work harder than anybody else. I come here earlier, I stay here later. Like, you know what? Fuck you. You suck. You fucking suck. Edmund Tiverdian, fuck off. And then I went to jump into my, my Honda, and slam the door, and roll up my one window. And he was like, hey, wait, wait, wait. Give me a ride to the bank. <laughs> like, not even sorry, not even anything. And so I'm just like fucking fuming. I'm like, just fucking guy, I didn't drive you to the fucking bing. You never drove me to the bing. You never did shit. He's like, all right, I'll train you. So my first amateur fight was against Hayden Munoz and Oxnard. I come out for the fight, and of course, like, I zone into like fucking Olympics mode. I'm here to kill a bitch. She like throws a kick right away. I catch it, I throw her. I go in for an arm bar and she taps right away. I was very excited. I, I mean, like, I, and I didn't expect to be that happy. I felt like I did something that no one else believed that I could do and it was all for me. It was like a feeling that I was addicted to immediately. And I felt like I was in on the secret that the rest of the world didn't know what I knew that I was in the beginning of something amazing. I was the one person watching this movie of my life that just, I just fucking knew I was gonna be the UFC champion and I was gonna shove it everybody's face that thought I was going to fail. So my first pro fight's coming up and my dog is a Dogo Argentino. She's an gnarly bitch. She looks like a gigantic white pit bull that is bred to hunt boars. My roommate's dog, Pork Chop, was like food aggressive. I was in my room and I heard them fighting and I'm like, shit. And I come out and like, Mochi's got this dog on the ground by the throat. And I'm like, my dog's gonna kill this dog. So I kicked Mochi in the ribs. Mochi lets go. Pork Chop is panicking, it's like biting and filling around. Bites me right to the foot and like one's up on the shin. I just remember looking like at the hole in the arch of my foot, like before it filled up with blood. And I'm like, oh fuck. I'm a fight in two days, I like, fucking fight. King of the cage and Tarzana. And I had nine stitches in my foot. We go to weigh in and then the commissioner is like, oh, we have to get on the scale with just your underwear, no socks, no shoes. And first of all, I'm like, who fucking makes this rule? Hey, you, chick, you can only be in your underwear. Like, what? And then I'm like, the stitches are gonna burst open, you're gonna bleed everywhere, they're gonna know. Because my plan at that point was socks. Uh, uh, uh. I'm gonna get naked, clothes coming off, clothes coming off. I just start taking off clothes, throwing them. And they're like, oh my God, get a towel. And so everyone thinks I'm just being crazy and wanna be naked. And being young, hot, and naked is a great distraction, I realized. So I jump on the scale with my back to everybody. I take off my socks last. And I weigh in like five pounds under. <laughs> and I put my socks back on first. And everyone just, you know, thought I was weird. So a great success to begin. And then I had a fight the next day. And still had nine stitches in my foot. I had to go into this fight. 
and the chick's like trying to look all crazy or mean or whatever, and I was just like, you don't fucking know crazy or mean or whatever, because I have a whole bunch like <laughs> balled up in me right now. I go out, jab straight in to try and get a grip behind her head so I can throw her. I'm like, I need to get this to the ground, finish this within a round, a minute, fast, like the clock's ticking. My shit's about to bust open. I grab her and then I go to throw her forward. She sticks her foot out to like block her weight. And I sweep her on the back of the heel with the arch of that foot right on the stitches. Of course, I had to sweep her right on that part of the foot. Take her down, la da da, arm bar. They pulled me off and I'm happy for a second, but then like everything in my mind is like, ah! <laughs> like <laughs> it was so goddamn painful. The next fight. I had Sarah D'Elio and she changed how I fought forever. We went out to fight and I went and got a sumi grip and I jumped to do it but there's no gi, so I slipped off. But as I slipped off, I changed it into an arm bar midair. I was pulling it as it hit, and I knew that second that her hand touches the ground, all my weights would go through her elbow, and I'm gonna obliterate her elbow. And as she was falling, she was going tap, 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 tap. I let my legs fall off and hit the bottom and reheld the position on my side. She's trying to tap. The referee calls it, and she goes, I didn't tap, and then the whole crowd starts booing. There seems to be some confusion. Delelio saying, what happened? Yeah. Let's see if we can see a tap here. She, she, she locked it out. I was so fucking pissed that I had what could have been a super highlight flying arm bar at women's MMA. And this fucking cunt ruined it. And I was like, that's it. I'm going to try and break every single fucking person's arm. And it is the referee's ah. responsibility to save them. And the next girl I fought, Julia Budd. It's time for action in the women's featherweight division as the undefeated submissions of on Rowdy Ronda Rousey faces striking specialist Julia the Jewel Bud. Ronda Rousey closes the distance on Julia Bud. This is exactly where Bud does not want to be because that might happen. A whirling dervish, a Rowdy Ronda Rousey. I go told her, and already going for the armbar. Belly down armbar here. Oh my goodness. This is unbelievable she if she gets his on. ear. Holy cow, that's dislocated. It's over, oh, unbelievable. Oh. Ronda Rousey does it again. They described her elbow as a flamingo knee. So then TMZ thing comes out, I see Dana's ask, oh, are women ever going to be in the UFC? Are we going to see women in the uh, UFC, man? Never. Never? He, like, laughs. Ha, 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 Dana. Never. He said that, and I'm like, well, that's because he hasn't met me yet. Because I was so assured that me and Dana White were going to be best friends one day. I was not discouraged in the least, because nobody knew who I was. Dana had no clue who I was, but I just knew that I'm like, this is my type of dude, and I know that I'm his type of bitch. And when our powers combine, like, the world will never be the same. He just doesn't know it yet. I was very up to date on everything happening in MMA at the time. I was doing recon. I wanted to know what everybody was doing, what all the other women were doing, and to figure out what they were doing wrong. And I knew what they were doing wrong as everyone was trying to be a baby face. I'm just happy to be here and compete in a competition and be great. There was no heels. There was no story. That's not what entertainment is. It's not, hey, she's probably going to turn over if I punch her in the face a couple times. She tried turning over, and then I jumped on her arm, and I felt it going out, like, and the referee told me not to say anything to her, and she wasn't saying anything or tapping, so I was like, all right, I'm going to try and stick it behind my back and pull it back even farther. I was definitely trying to get the UFC's attention, specifically Dana's attention, not just from the finishes, but from my media and my interviews. I would just say the most sensationalist stuff that I could think of, just to get a reaction. Um, I decided that I was actually going to try I break her arm, so <laughs> I love this girl. Usually I let people try to tap, you know? So. People can forget fighters, but they remember characters, and I wanted to be a character. I wanted to be an extremely exaggerated version of myself. I didn't want to be fake, but I wanted to hear what the little devil on my shoulder was saying. So I purposely went out to piss a whole bunch of people off. I don't know her from a hole in the wall. I don't really care if she likes me or not. I wouldn't like me if I was her. So I started getting attention like that, and it got to the point where Dana would have to actively try to not know who I was 
from not just the way that I fought, but the way that I spoke. And no one in women's MMA was doing it at the time, and no one's done it in the same way since. Ishte won the 135 Strike Force title. Jay Kunin has never been submitted. Has he submitted? Submit, 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 submit. And I was like, Misha's halfway good looking. I'm fucking hot. Like, we need two hot chicks fighting. And for there to be, like, animosity going on. I had to make it into a show. Maybe she should go watch some of my interviews. I do watch your interviews. You don't watch mine, remember? That's what she said on HD. You know? Or maybe you do. You want to change your mind on that, too? <laughs> I think my first press conference, actually, and I was just the cattiest bitch ever, and it ended up paying off great. A bunch of girls I never knew before just suddenly don't like me. It's not really my problem. We had to stare down, and then she touched her forehead to my forehead, so I, like, pushed her back on my head, and she, like, went on Twitter and says, Rhonda needs to be fine for headbutting me. And then I beat her ass the next day. And in the best way possible, I would say. So she came in, she charges in right away. I get her in the clinch, I take her down. I end up scrambling around. So she's got my back and I'm not panicking. I'm like, this is just a link to somewhere else. But I would wear some short shorts and I realized I gotta pull this bitch's heel. And this is going to pull my shorts to the side. And Everyone's going to see me in all of my glory. And I'll tell you, it is glorious, okay? It's blindingly so. But it's not for everyone, okay? You have to earn the glory. And so I'm like, shit, I can't just flash the whole crowd. So I had to like hide my crotch. So I'm just like, all right, uh, hold on a sec, bitch. And I get up on my knees, like wearing her like a backpack. And then I ended up getting her on the ground. I did a really cool cartwheel, actually, cutting from one side to the other. I ended up getting her in our bar, and she didn't want to tap. So I was like, well, fucking fine. I learned this shit. So once you can't arch your back anymore backwards, you can actually pull the arm off to the side. And I like pulled the arm off to the side, and it went like more than nine degrees out the other direction. And like just as I was about to start punching in the face with her elbow out, then she tapped out. It couldn't have been more perfect. Everybody knew who I was after that. First time I ever talked to Dana was after that fight. He called me and he was like, Hey, this is Dana. Oh, I like, do that thing, put the phone to the side, like, ah! They were like, Okay, yeah, yeah, hi, Dana, what's up? And it was him and Lorenzo. They're like, You did so awesome. In my mind, I was like the emperor from like, you know, Star Wars, just like, everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. Like, I just knew it. I was just watching the universe conspire towards my success. And then I had to fight Sarah Kaufman. And it's in San Diego, and Dana actually is coming to the fight. And he's sitting front row. I came out, I did like a triple jab in a row, and then took her down and got her an arm bar right in front of Dana. Like, this is for you. I swear to God, I don't know if I could see him. I like to think we like locked eyes. I'm like, <laughs> looking at him, you know? It was completely undeniable in that moment that I am a special fighter, and he knew it. So Dana called me up, like the best friends that we are, and he was like, I'm going to be in town for the Sons of Anarchy premiere. You should come with me. And I'm like, yeah, totally. <laughs> of course, I'm like, ah, my best friends. That's like what best friends do. We somehow ended up at Mr. Chow's, and he was like, so, there's a reason why I invited you to this place. So my Dana voice is really bad, and he's going to hate this, which is even better. So I brought you here, because a year and a half ago, right outside, I told TMZ that women were never going to be in the UFC. And I brought you here today to tell you you're going to be the first woman in the UFC. And I was like, trying to suppress it. I didn't even know what I said at the time. I was just like. Like, thank you so much. I'm gonna prove you right. Like, my, my mission in life is to prove you right. And this is the best decision that you ever made. 
Then we're at the premiere, and there's all these people, you know, cheering. For, and then I step out of the car, and all the people cheering, they're like, fucking Ronda! Like, I got a huge pop, and I was not expecting that shit at all. And I was like, excellent, yes, keep cheering, keep cheering for Dana! You know, like, let him know that he did the right thing. I don't give a fuck if they're cheering for me, but I gave a fuck that they were cheering for me in front of Dana, you know? So he was just like, oh yeah, this is gonna work out great. UFC women's champion, Ronda Rousey. <laughs> I didn't want to just be given the title. I wanted to earn it. But, you know, that was what Dana wanted. So he was like, well, we already did it for the guys, so, like, you're, like, Miss Fucking Equality, and uh, we're gonna do it for you. I'm like, touche, motherfucker, all right. And you got me on that one. Then he's like, um, your car. I'm like, what's wrong with the Fonda? And he goes, fucking embarrassing. Just pick a car. Just pick any car. J just don't drive that car. <laughs> and so within one week, I signed to the UFC, got a new car. And there's more pressure than ever because I still had to prove Dana right, and I promised him that I would. And I had all the pressure in the world on me, not just to win, but to make it exciting. The thing is, I'd been preparing for all or nothing situations my whole life. Like, I wanted to win the Olympics, and you train your whole life and you get one day to make that happen. And I failed. And then I went back to another Olympics and it was my one opportunity to make it all happen and I failed. I went to the world championships, you know, like my mom won the world championships and I was in the finals and I failed. There had been so many times where I'd been working so hard to have a single opportunity and I already failed. And this was the opportunity to make all those failures mean something, but it was also an opportunity to fail again. But I knew that this was the time that it was all going to go right. For Ronda Rousey, this is a, a moment for women's sports, period. This is gonna open the door to so many young women that never thought about doing this as a career. I go in for the fight. I was nervous and I rushed it. I rushed the clinch, I rushed the takedown. Instead of working her against the cage the way I should have, I rushed for a takedown. And so I'm in a position where, like, she's working this choke, but I'm like, oh, pff, she's not gonna wear this choke. Like, I, I got the best choke defense ever. Ron is trying to pry those fingers off of her face, but Ron is in a very bad situation here. Oh, trying to lock it in. She's getting her face cranked. And she's like, fuck you, I'm not trying to choke you, I'm gonna break your goddamn face. I could feel my sinuses popping, and then the choke came down across my jaw, and she dislocated my jaw, and I was just like, there's no fucking way I am going to give up here. Like, I will die. She will break my neck, and I will die, or I'm gonna get out of this. Rhonda's gotta shake her off the top! And so I was just like, chin, heel. Just surgically, like, broke everything down. How do I get out of the situation? and turned my face the right way as all of her weight's on my face. Took her heel, she falls off my back. She kicks me straight in the chest. Now I'm just like, you are never getting off the fucking ground again. The way that I passed her guard is I did another backflip into side control. And I was like, I'm just gonna punch you in the head until you put your arm exactly where I want it because I needed to get her elbow on the other side of my head. But she also knew that. She took it for a while and I was just like, I will do this all fucking day. And then she finally got her arm, place that I wanted it, other side of my head so I could step and move into position and isolate everything the way that I wanted. And man, she was holding on real hard for dear life, but there's no way on earth, I don't care how strong you are, my technique and the way that I'm able to break the grip for the arm is second to none and no one could stop it. So I was like also in that position where I'm like, my mom is in my head like, if you get in a position for an arm bar and you lose, you fucking deserve to lose. You already have this, don't fuck this up. And then broke her grip, got her arm straight, and she tapped. It was like the movie of my life that I had been living up to that point. I was finally in my fucking Adrian moment. It was unbelievable. In that moment, I was willing to be permanently disfigured. I was willing to die. She was gonna have to pull that title out of my cold, dead fingers. I was willing to do anything that it took to win. And 
Now the world is different. You're a true champion. Congratulations. It's an honor to call your first fight. This crowd absolutely loves this girl. Yeah, I mean, how could they not? She's not just the, the first UFC women's champion. She's a female hero. I mean, do you know how many women are changing the way they look at athletics because of this woman? Changing the way they look at what's possible for women to accomplish in sports? I joke all the time, if I had been born at any other time in history, they would have burned me at the stake. My mom was the baddest bitch on the planet before me, but there was no way for her to prove it on the scale that I did. All the stars just kind of aligned in that moment, and it was something that people always wanted to see, but it was the time that they needed to see it. I knew that I was being led by fate and destiny that whole time. Slowly, everybody else started to realize it, too. I was the embodiment of an idea whose time had come. <laughs>